Hey everyone, Tim from Toolpath here. Another uh, geek tips video. Uh, I've been getting some good feedback uh, on the videos we did in the last uh, couple videos. I'm sure Ben can put some links to the other ones somewhere. Um, I've had a few questions about adaptive and kind of particularly I've heard a couple people refer to it as tricoidal. That got me fired up enough to make a special video. So I thought it would be worth kind of talking a little bit about adaptive roughing, why it's awesome, why it like changed my life, why it really changed the industry. There's not a ton of things we can point to and, and comfortably say it, it was industry changing. And adaptive milling, or like a generic term I would like to, to use, would be like a, a constant engagement roughing. Um, so let's get into that. It's something we've been working on at Toolpath quite a bit as we're automating the, the CAM programming. And so we've been digging into some of the, the deeper, geekier sides of adaptive to make sure uh, we're getting it to work well. Um, so let's, let's dive right into it. First, let's talk about kind of a, the, the terminology. So adaptive milling is a, a toolpath name, a brand name basically, that came from HSM Works uh, quite a while ago now. Um, there's some, some good gritty... Uh, history lessons there you might be able to find on the internet. Um, it was originally in Mastercam and there's some fun stories behind that. But um, if you're looking at brand names, you'd have adaptive milling from Autodesk, HSM, Fusion, uh, dynamic uh, milling in Mastercam. You'll hear, hear the term HEM or high efficiency milling. Uh, that's usually used from like tool manufacturers as the reference. They're trying to come up with a generic term for this. Uh, I machining and solid cam, profit milling in a spree, volume mill from cam works, uh, high speed adaptive from Bob. Uh, and then this is where I, I get uh, my, my dork, you know, super geek stuff kicks in. When you start hearing tricoidal, or I've even heard uh, cy cycloidal. Uh, now, tri tricoid and cycloidal are kind of math terms, and they're they're used a little bit inappropriately when you look at toolpaths because an older uh, tricoidal toolpath, something like you'd see something like people misuse when they, they refer to an adaptive or constant engagement toolpath. Uh, tricoidal was an older toolpath that literally just took circles and linked them together. And some of the more advanced, it was really made for slotting, right? And then some of the more advanced uh, tricoidal toolpaths we're able to take variable size circles and, and link them together. You'll see that even in Autodesk products um, like FeatureCam. So uh, you don't need a math lesson for me. Um, go out if you care. I mean, I cared. Uh, you can go ahead and look up tricoid, a trochoid, uh, cycloidal. Those kind of there's mathematical definitions for there, and then go poke around and look what you can find with tricoidal toolpaths, and you'll see they're quite a bit different. Uh, even our friends over at Harvey Tool kind of refer to it a little bit different, but they have some some good images that that are tricoidal toolpaths. So I'll uh, I'll digress and move on from there. Um, let's take a look at 3D adaptive or not 3D adaptive, but but 2D adaptive or just the adaptive toolpath and understand why it's changed the industry so much. And what I'm referring to is a toolpath like this when you compare it to a toolpath like this. This is what I would call like an old school or, or slow school kind of traditional um, traditional pocket. And even if you zoom in, you can see there's a yellow move over here, so it slows down in the corner. That that was pretty pretty awesome back back in the day, um, but nothing like how much we changed the industry with toolpaths like these. If you look at a traditional kind of old school pocket, you'd have that, you'd have this. Uh, real problems here, problems in here, and and here. So let's just do a stock simulation. I'll try to keep this one kind of short. Um, but I want people to understand what's happening with adaptive um, and see if we can better understand it. If you better understand it, you could probably uh, learn how to drive it uh, better. So we'll do a stock simulation. We'll hit play until we get to full depth because that's going to helix in first. So I want to stop it right when it goes full depth, right? 
So you just broke through here and then you know now now you're at full depth about here. So then you'll notice here that it looked like it was a full slot down there, but remember it was only the, the, the little bit that it fell through at the bottom. So now that we're here, we can kind of scrub through this, and this is a simulation tip if you didn't know it. You can left click hold. I've talked about it probably in, in the last few videos I've done. You can left click hold in simulation mode, and you can just kind of drag it along. But if I stop, no matter where I stop, you can draw a line from the center of the tool to the leading edge of engagement and to the trailing edge of engagement. And that's a term that'll be used uh, that you'll hear. can't remember what other um, constant engagement toolpath uses it. I think it might be iMachining, something like that. But you'll have to give it an input of what they call tool engagement angle. Um, TEA or something like that. So you'll have to give it this angle. And adaptive in HSM, they they give what you call a. Um, I'll I'll look it up here in a second, but it's a constant engagement is is what's happening. Is this angle no matter where you stop it, it never changes. You can draw a line from there to there, check the angles, and it'll always be the same. Even when you get into these tighter areas, the and the the term adaptive comes from the toolpath always adapting its direction uh, based on uh, the engagement angle. So it's always, always adapting to hit that same engagement angle. So your tool load, back in my Autodesk days, we had this really cool uh, data acquisition. Spikes, I think, made, made this tool that had uh, pullout forces, bending forces, and all kinds of cool stuff. And the nice thing with adaptive, you can actually go find a, a YouTube video about that um, that I think we did at the pier. Um, but it shows like really consistent loads with no load spikes. And so if I, anytime I stop this here, if you go from the center over to here and the center over to here, you'll never get, it basically engages as quickly as it can to that angle and then it maintains it. When you get into the corners, it's a pretty short time that, that it's fully engaged like that. So that's there. And then let's show the outside. Ah, this isn't a great example. What you'll see is the step over as you get into these tight areas, the step over looks like it gets smaller and smaller. And that's to satisfy that tool engagement angle. What you'll also notice is as you round the outside, and I can actually, I believe I can just make um, make the stock uh, bigger to, to show you. Man, I was hoping to keep this video short. There's just so much good geek talk to, to share. Um, but what you'll see here is that the toolpath actually looks like it's taking a bigger cut as it comes around the outsides, right? Like if you look in here, the, the cuts look kind of small. And if you measured from here to here, it'd be bigger. And that's because you, they have to they have to in order to get, you know, if you can just visually look at this here. If you visually look at this here from there to there. And then if, if you, you know, it's, it's pretty close. And then what they're doing is they're making a bigger step over to, to keep that, that engagement angle the same. So some people get kind of freaked out by, by noticing that it looks like it's taking a bigger step over on the outside external corners. And that's because it's trying to maintain that, that constant engagement angle. So let's look at a traditional pocket and let's just look at a simulation and see the same thing. So if we let that thing go, ah, uh, this, this is taking it in steps. So, so a most common traditional pocket, you would have to, feed the whole toolpath to survive these really crummy corners. And because of that, you would have to take kind of shallower step down. So I, I did this one. So it'd be easier to kind of visualize what's happening as far as the tool engagement angle. And once this thing breaks through, now as I scrub 
through the toolpath, you'll see it's slotting, right? Now it's outside of the pocket that it made. So you'll see from here it's slotting. And that's such a huge load spike. Chips don't like to get out of that, that, that area. Depending on how deep the pocket is, you can really jam, jam some chips in there, starve it of coolant, break your tool. So what would happen for a traditional pocket is you have to change your cutting parameters. That's your, your axial step down, your radial. Usually you go a big radial step over and a shallow axial. Um, but then you really have to change your, your speeds and your feeds to survive these slotting conditions. Right, even though the majority of your cut is going to look like like this, you know that that doesn't look like bad cutting conditions, right? But that does. So it'd be pretty common that you would get into the cut, and and you just have these just huge load changes. And maybe it works when you're setting up your your tool, but like right when you go in here, now you're slotting, right? And so in the middle of the night, if you're running unattended, you might get a tool breakage there. That's hard to diagnose because when you set up your job, it was working fine. A little bit of tool wear, your coolant burps, you know, whatever happens, you have know, uh, really inconsistent cutting conditions that, that lead to problems. Now, this is a little controversial uh, when you're talking to people cutting softer materials. Things like plastics might not be a big deal at all. Um, if we were looking at aluminum, uh, this is where I'm seeing people play with going back and forth. Uh, I would have to say uh, you can save a lot of time here. If you look at the simulation time for these two toolpaths, if you look at this one and this one at full depth, uh, simulated time is 40 seconds, and it's about a minute and a half for, for these two toolpaths. The difference is these two will never have load spikes. Just never, it's just a condition of, of how the toolpaths are made. Um, where this, you have some big load spikes. Uh, and even here, it can't get through this area, so it, it makes this helix, which is kind of funky, right? Um, but if you can get away with it, there's time to be saved. So it's 40 seconds, right? It's a lot less travel time uh, to do that. Um, typically, I would do that if it didn't have these really kind of steep included angles, uh, if it was a very basic feature, Without these kind of load spike areas uh, in aluminum, maybe two times diameter uh, pockets are smaller. I might I might flirt with that just to save some cycle times on on bigger run jobs. But I have to say I really like process reliability, so I would usually default to a toolpath like this. So the the other thing that you get with an adaptive toolpath is you're better off using your full flute length. I usually go up to about four times diameter. Um, and what that does is, is it does a lot of things for stabilizing the cut of the tool. Um, and then typically what you do is you go with a smaller uh, radial depth of cut. And I was drawing a blank on the, on the name. Um, it's uh, optimal load, right? So what optimal load is, let's explain that real quick. Uh, what optimal load is, is they calculate the tool path as if it was just side cutting. So once this goes to a straight cut, I'll stop it. Yeah, that's not a good example. Uh, I should have done the outside. Uh, let's do the outside real quick. Sorry about that. So... Once the tool, uh, what they do is people think of tools as like uh, step overs as a step over, right? Like an old traditional pocket step over. So this has, I think it's about a 40% step over. It might be 35, but it's from, from here to here. Uh, that's your step over as if you're just side cutting. And so that's your optimal load. And then what Adaptive is doing is it's calculating the tool engagement angle as if you were just taking a straight side cut. And then that's what it's doing. It's adapting the whole tool path to try to maintain that constant engagement. Um, and, and you reduce these, these huge load spikes. So back to what I was talking about with Adaptive. Um, because you have this very constant engagement uh, tool path, 
Um, you can now start playing, but and you're using a little bit lighter radial depth of cut with longer axial depths of cut. What you can start doing is playing with the, uh, because you can start playing with the chip load. Because as you back out the, as you back out the cut radially, you're actually creating what we call chip thinning, right? The, the chip, uh, if you have a chip load of 5 thou or 10 thou, the only time the chip will measure 10 thou or whatever your chip load distance is, is if you were cutting at a 50% step over. Anything lower than that, the chip actually gets thinner and thinner and thinner. But the visual for this is right here. If you're at a 50% step over, your chip load will equal your chip thickness. Any, the less and less and less you go, all the math for this is down here. But the, the chip gets thinner and thinner and thinner. Now you have a few problems with that. The chip is the number one thing that pulls the heat out of the cut and out of your tool. So you want a thick chip uh, to help pull heat out of the cut. If you're dealing with hard materials, high nickel materials, this is really, really important. So then what you would want to do is you'd actually want to increase your chip load so your chip thickness is, is more of what the manufacturer recommended. Um, you can read this article. It is a good article. Um, but the concept is the, the less and less you go in ax radial step over, in theory, you should be kind of bumping up the, the chip load. All these things are very intertwined. We can have some really deep down, deep dive um, videos about that. I don't think that was my intention getting into this video. So I'm going to probably wrap it up. Um, how is this relevant to my job at Toolpath? Uh, this is actually a really fun part of my job at Toolpath. You know, we're trying to automate uh, a lot of our, our redundant kind of repetitive work to free people up. To, to do the deeper thinking, um, solving, solving cutting condition problems, solving fixturing problems. So our intent is to get you, when we get to the toolpath side, outside of estimating, estimating is great with toolpath now, but our intent with automating toolpaths is to get you most of the way there. So these conversations that I'm doing in these geek videos, uh, you can leverage, you know, the knowledge and experience you have to to, to fine tune things, solve work holding problems, solve gnarly tolerance problems, solve tool life problems, you know, solve all those problems instead of, you know, the mundane, you know, setting heights, picking geometry, setting heights, picking geometry, you know, coming up here and, and doing a search of what all these corner radii are. So you can go find the right tool, see if you have the right tool. Uh, that's our job at Toolpath is to, to use the power of AI and some magical stuff, you know, in computing to help you do all those kind of things that should be really easy to automate with, with software. So you can use your creative brain, your problem solving brain to, to go solve higher level problems. So check out Toolpath, uh, comment, keep commenting in these videos. It's been really fun for me to see people's pro tips. It's been fun for me to see what people appreciate. Um, and I'll try to keep them shorter and shorter, maybe break them up, you know, with the topics. So with that, cheers. Have a great weekend. And we'll talk to you guys soon.